This is the teaching text. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the, <coughs> sorry, among the Gentiles, so that when they slander against you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. This is the word of the Lord. This is our seventh week in our current series called Gospel Fluency. I don't have enough time now to take you through the previous six weeks. I do just want to spotlight the sermon that Lasejo preached last week on the gospel and culture. One of our distinctives is that we are a transcultural church. So we want to move past our man-made boundaries and transcend it into one new community in Christ. And Lasejo did a really good job last week in just explaining what that means. So if you missed last week, please go and give it a listen. If you missed our previous six weeks, it's all on the podcast, it's all on YouTube, you can go and catch up. Today, our theme is the gospel in our actions. I want to show you a slide. Here's what the slide says, and then I'll explain it. So the slide says, most Christians lack Jesus' love for others. Okay? That's the conclusion of a study that was done by the Bona Group. Bona is known worldwide for doing empirical research on church, faith, communities, and people. They conducted a research with one leading question, and that was, how Christ-like are Christians? Because obviously, Christians are supposed to be Christ-like. They asked 20 questions to self-identified Christians. Okay, so people who say that I'm a Christian, and people who answered the questions about themselves, not about anyone else. And after they conducted the research, they included four categories of people. The one is people who are Christ-like in action and in their attitude. So if you just look at this graph, you've got actions, vertical, and you've got attitudes, horizontal. So how Christ-like are you in your attitudes and in your actions? So top right represents people who are Christ-like in action and in attitude. I don't know about you, but 14% isn't even a pass in the South African education system. Do you know what I mean? That's a serious fail. Then you get people who are Christ-like in action, but not in attitude, right? So Christ-like in action, but pharisaical in attitude, is another 14% of people. I'll explain that now. Then you get people who are Christ-like in their attitude, but not in their action, and then you get people who are Christ-like in neither. To the left, to the left, bottom left. 51% of self-identified Christians talking about themselves do not represent Christ in either action or in attitude. Hectic. Only one in seven Christians seem to represent the actions and attitudes that the Bona researchers found to be consistent with those of Jesus. Our actions matter, fam. Why? Because through our actions, we reveal the gospel or the not gospel. If we tend to fail in our attitude and our actions. Throughout this whole series, we've said that gospel fluency is knowing how the gospel applies to your life in every area without having to think about it. It comes naturally in the same way that a language in which you are fluent comes naturally. How will you and I know if we are on our way to gospel fluency? What are the markers 
that we've strayed from the path? And how will we know how to get back on track? I want to offer you three waypoints to gospel fluency this morning. It'll be up on the screen now. Who are we? Verses 9 to 10 of our teaching text. Where are we? Verses 11 to 12. And then also the answer to the question, how should we conduct ourselves? These are the three waypoints to gospel fluency. If you've never heard the word waypoint, a waypoint is a reference point that helps us to know where we are and where we are going. Kuliso said, if you're looking for the clicks, start at Mr. Price, right? So that's your first waypoint. It is a marker. And once I get there, I know that I am en route to my destination. Knowing who we are, knowing where we are, and knowing how we should conduct ourselves will most definitely get us to gospel fluency. Think of question of the day and that feeling of realizing that you are lost or that feeling of getting lost that you shared. It's not a great feeling. Because once you realize that you are lost, your immediate response is, I need something now to get me back on track, right? So you want to fix the problem. I don't know about you, but this research that I just showed you gives me that feeling as a Christian. To see that we have actually strayed from the path. To see that half of us do not, rep do not represent Jesus at all, in either action or in attitude. And then it's a really small percentage of us that represent him well, and it's a small-ish percentage who represent him sometimes in either attitude or in action. Then we should muster up the courage to stop and to find our way back. So today should be one of those days in which we examine our actions and our attitudes in light of who we are, where we are, and what the Bible says, how we should conduct ourselves. Before we jump in, let me do a prayer for us. Lord Jesus, we want to represent you well. We are your ambassadors. We have you living inside of us as temples. We have a brand new identity. And somehow, Lord Jesus, we keep on failing in both action and in attitude. And we don't want to do that, Lord Jesus. We want to live for your glory and for your honor and to reveal you and to reveal your good news and to see your kingdom come. So, Lord Jesus, as we open up the scriptures now and as we look at these three simple waypoints, I pray that you would really enlighten our hearts and our minds to hear and to know and to believe and to experience what it is that you would want us to hear, believe and experience. I pray, Lord Jesus, that my message would flow in a massive river of grace. That this would not feel judgmental or like anything condemning us. But that it would rather liberate us from the bondage of sin. And that it would free us to live from grace. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd speak to us. I pray against any distraction that we might have. May we be transformed in this moment. We pray that in your name. Amen. Just a, a quick definition. As I was praying, I was thinking about pharisaical, according to the study, means that you either believe that you are better than other people or that you do things from a position of guilt and obligation and not from grace. Okay, so do you guys see it? So it's pride on the one hand, I'm not as bad as. And on the other hand, if I don't read Bible, I'm in trouble. So that's why I read my Bible. Whereas... The gospel humbles us to know that everyone uh, falls short of the glory of God. And on this side, grace motivates us to live for God's glory. Do you guys see it? Okay, cool. Let's look at the first waypoint. Who we are. You and I know that our actions flow from our identity or our identity overflows into our actions. I am a dad. It's one of the tags that I carry in this world. Which means I wake up my kids. Which means I tend to them if they call for help. Which means that I give them brekkie. Which means that after brekkie I tell them when we reach half past six you guys have to go and brush your teeth. Which means I take them to school. Which means I love them, care for them, nurture them, etc. If I didn't have kids, I wouldn't have done any of that. 
So my identity as dad overflows into my actions. I'm also a runner. That's another tag I carry. Because I am a runner, I put on my running shoes and I go for a run and I come back, right? You can't say that you're a runner, but it actually never overflows into your actions. So if you're a Christian, what then? If you're a Christian, you love and you serve and you sacrifice and you listen and you show compassion and you proclaim and you call and you share and I can carry on with verbs until lunchtime. Our identity as Christians overflows into our actions. May I remind you, let's start with some good news here, that you were given a brand new identity by God through Jesus because of His atoning sacrifice on the cross and because of His resurrection. That means it doesn't matter who you were, it also doesn't matter who you are, you get a brand new identity because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. God is our Father, we are His children. He is our God, we are His people. He is eternal and He wants to be with us into eternity. He created everything to be good and He will make everything new in the end. Everything is broken in the middle, but God decided to start repairing the things that was broken in the middle. That's all the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you believe that, when the gift of faith is presented to you and you grip it by taking a leap of faith and putting your trust in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you get a new identity. Now you live from that identity and that identity overflows into your actions. Not by our own power, not, be, not by our own doing, but by the grace of God and through the means of His Holy Spirit that He gave us. Fam, may I remind you that God, the eternal creator and sustainer of everything who was, is, and is to come, who is bigger than we can ever imagine, who is indescribable and unfathomable, lives inside of you. Not in Polokwane, not in Cape Town, not in Tasmania. He's not far. He's also not skin close. He's inside close. Because he wants to be in a relationship with you. And when he lives inside of you through his Holy Spirit, that's when he transforms you. And that's when your actions start mirroring your inward identity. That's why before Peter tells us what to do in verses 11 to 12, he first tells us who we are. So let me show you the teaching text again. The bold and the highlights and the underline is my own doing. I'm going to keep the slide up and we are going to work through each and every one of them and it is going to be awesome, I promise. So Peter concludes the first section of his letter by drawing lines for a confrontation. Right? Peter is busy saying, guys, there's a fight going on here, and I need to point your attention to it. Peter says there are two groups, and these two groups are differentiated. The one group is unbelievers, or Gentiles, and the other group is the beloved, right? those who God love, those who believe. And they are separated into these two groups because of their contrasting responses to Jesus Christ. The former are on their way to stumbling and shame because they don't believe in Jesus. And the latter is on their way to honor and to vindication because they believe in Jesus. So these two groups say something different about God. And because these two groups say something different about God, they are going to clash. And with it will come social tensions. And these social tensions between the non-believers and the believers are actually the subject of Peter's interest through the remainder of this epistle. But we're not going to study 1 Peter as a whole. I just wanted to say where he's progressed in his letter. And now he gives us these four epic titles. Look at it with me. Chosen race. Royal priesthood. It means a kingdom of priests. I'll explain that now. A holy nation. And a people for his possession. 
all four of these titles of honor appear to be adaptations of titles from either Exodus or Isaiah. So these were titles that were originally designated for the people of Israel. Okay? The first and the last of the titles, so chosen race and a people for his possession, they come from Isaiah 43. I'm going to read it now. And then the second and the third come from Exodus 19. So let me read Exodus 19 to you. It's not going to be on the slides. Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. Now, if you carefully will listen to me and keep my command, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. Back, 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 back in the day when the Israelites were caught in slavery, when they were enslaved for 400 years and wondering if God is going to keep His promises, right? Promise keeper. Da, 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 da. Are you guys with me here? That's what God said to His people. And now what does Peter say to the Christians who are also God's people? One and the same people. This is who you are. Isaiah 43, verses 20 to 21. It says, wild animals, I know it's a weird start, just go with me here. Wild animals, jackals and ostriches, will honor me because I provide water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to who? My chosen people. The people I formed for myself will declare my praise. So from the Old Testament, Peter quotes, and Peter quotes and says, this is who you are. A chosen race. That word chosen is not a verb, it's an adjective, right? And race is the noun. So adjective describes the noun. Preferenced, wanted, selected, chosen. And not a chosen group of sports players or a chosen group of middle class people. A chosen race. A chosen kind of person that comes with everything that comes with race. Which includes culture, language, manners, etc. etc. You are a chosen race. It's the first one. Second one. You are a royal priesthood. Now, this is an interesting translation, royal priesthood, because in Greek it literally says kingdom of priests, which means there's a king, which means there's a kingdom, and which means everyone in the kingdom is a priest. Do you guys see that? And then this translation, royal priesthood, leads to you build a bridge not to anyone but the king. Do you guys see it? The word priest, in its simplest form, means bridge. You want to come from year to year. Walk over this. That's what a priest does. You're a human. He's God. Can I connect you? Come through me, a mediator, a middleman. That is what a priest is. We are a royal priesthood folk, which means we don't connect people to a funeral plan. We don't connect people to a better diet. We connect people to the king of the world. That is what we connect people to. And not only that, everyone plays the role of a bridge. Because it's a kingdom full of priests. Which means each and every one of you can be a bridge. Should be a bridge. Are a bridge. I think everyone should be followed by is. Everyone is a bridge. Third one, a holy nation, set apart, different, a different what? A different nation. All of us, if we talk nations now, I could say, when you think of the Americans, who do you think about? When you think of Australian people, what do you think about? If you think of Germans, what do you think about? Why? Because nations are known for certain things. We are a nation that is known for what? For being different. For being holy. For being set apart for specific and special use. 
I've used this before. I'm going to use it again because it works. I love having people in our house. We even say, make yourself at home. I've got no issue with you trying to figure out our coffee machine because that's also part of the gospel. I've got no issue with you chilling on our couches, kicking out your shoes. I've got no issue with you using our bathroom. Our bed is holy. It's set apart for a specific purpose. We're not going to chill on our bed. It doesn't work like that. It's holy. Why? Because it's designated for something. We are a holy nation. So in the same way that I mentioned nations of this world, if I say, and Christians, we should be able to go, they are known for this, 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 and this. Why? Because they are different. And they are set apart. A people for His possession. This is critical. We are not set apart for accomplishing our own mission. We are not set apart for being great in the eyes of the world. We are set apart so that we could be His possession. That is who we are. And if that is our identity, then that identity should overflow into our actions. Now just before we continue, let me just show you something here. Note the both and. Note the in-between of all four of these titles. What I mean with both and is, I am both a child of God and white. So I'm part of another race as well. I am both a priest in a different kingdom and I'm a citizen of South Africa in this world. You guys see it? I'm both set apart for God and I need to live everyday life here. I am both a people for His possession and I want to uh, uh, submit to only Him and I need to submit to the rules and authorities of this world. We live in a tension, guys. Because both of these realities and both of these identities want us to act according to them. Do you guys see it? So the Word of God wants us to act according to, and the culture and the life that we live on earth wants me to act according to. So I'll always find this tension between these four things. And therefore, if your actions overflow from your identity and your actions does not mirror the actions and the attitudes of Jesus Christ, then the question is, which one is pulling you? And which one is determining your actions? The temptations not to go into being a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation and a people for His possession is definitely there in both word and action. I mean, think about it, guys. Whenever I need to act according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there's an easier way, which is determined by my culture or my race in this world, it's really easy just to default back to it. Why? Because we've done it a gazillion times. It's, it's difficult to choose against your racial orientation if the gospel asks you for something different. Because we default to what we know. Think about building a bridge and connecting people to the king. The temptation to talk about CrossFit, to talk about your Garmin watch, and to talk about veganism, it's always there. I know I have to talk to this guy about faith, but woo, I see he's got a new forerunner. So let's talk about his watch. Great conversation. And then we're making people converts for, uh, for smart watches and for veganism, but they're still going to hell. It's a temptation that we need to face and then we need to own. Just think about being a holy nation, being different. How big is the temptation to just do as everyone else is doing? It's always there, fam. It's always there to drink as much as my buddies. It's always there to gossip as much as the next person. It's always there to lie to cover your own shame. It's always there to be disrespectful to people because you feel superior in some sense. It's always there. The temptation is always there to not talk about the fact that being uh, possessed by God and being one of His children is the most fulfilling experience you could ever have and rather talk about your own accomplishments, your own dreams and your own greatness. 
The temptation is always there not to talk about the joy of being one of God's children. And so many interactions that I have in my own day-to-day life come to mind when I say these things. The temptation is real. But this elect community of God lives between the darkness of its pagan past and the light of the future that awaits them. Do you see the in-between? We are alienated from the one. We don't live as the world or in the world. But we are also not yet home completely and fully. We are strangers and we are foreigners. That's what verse 11 says. Okay, so that's who we are. That's the biggest one. I won't take as much time with the other. Let's look at where we are. The Christian life was never meant to be lived individually. We all know that. We were made for fellowship. We were made for community. Neither was the Christian life meant to be lived in a vacuum. Okay? Jesus prays in John 17 to the Father that as He leaves them here, may they be. Because we are left here for a reason. Don't think left behind if you read the books. Chill. I'm not talking about left behind. I'm talking about being left in this world to live here as Christians. Verses 11 to 12 explain these two halves of the Christian life. And most people, at least according to the research that I showed you, do one or the other well, but we don't do both well. Okay? So they abstain from passions of the flesh. So you get Christians who really fight sin, but they do it completely out of the world, as if you only live in a Christian commune, right? You don't interact, chat, serve, or love anyone who doesn't wear a cross around the neck. Like, my life is good, man. There are a lot of people. I'm in a city group. I am loving my wife. I'm loving my family, but they're all Christians. I've got no idea what's going on in the world. You get many people who do that. And then you get many people who live among non-believers, but then just give up on the fight against sin. In other words, that look alike the world and its sinful ways. Now there's a problem with both of these if you can't do them together. The one is, if you live in your Christian commune or your little bubble where you've got nothing to do with the world, then people can't see according to the text and they can't glorify according to the text because they literally can't see you. That's really important. I live in a townhouse complex. And often I think of myself, or I think to myself, what if I'm a really, really good Christian and I love my wife and my kids really well, but no one could ever see it? That would be a problem. I'm like this ivory tower little Christian in 30 Blue Crane in Von Willig Avenue. That can't work. People never see it. And then on the other hand, If you do not fight sin and you live according to the standards of this world, then no one can see or glorify either. Because there's nothing to see or glorify. Do you guys get me? So, either half without the other hinders God's gospel work. And now what Peter is doing here in this section is he sketches a battle plan for this inevitable confrontation that's going to happen between Christians and the Roman society. Or, in our vernacular, between Christians and the world. Now, this battle plan is not an aggressive one. Check. It's a gentle one. And it's in the tradition of Paul's advice to the Romans not to, do you guys remember Romans 12, 21? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And when Peter says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, he starts with the assumption And this is important, fam, you need to focus now. That the first and most immediate conflict we will have as Christians are within us as believers. There's a fight going on here. There's a real battle going on in your soul and in your mind and between your soul and your mind. And Peter knows that our natural impulses towards survival and acceptance in the world, and this fight that these impulses have with our souls is what kills us, is what makes us not live with Christ-like attitudes or actions. Now, this imagery of one's natural impulses waging war against your ultimate best is paralleled in different uh, uh, parts of the New Testament as well. I just want to read to you quickly. Romans 7, verse 22 to 24, as well as James 4, verse 1. 
2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 6, I won't read, but that's another part, uh, explaining this counter-warfare that we have inside of us. Hear what Romans 7 says. He says, For in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. Listen to Paul. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul feels you, man. And I feel you. Because I know that the war is inside. James 4 verse 1 says, What is the source of wars and fights among you? They don't, come, uh, don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? Let me say it in modern day South African vernac. Let me use a hashtag. Hashtag your struggle is real. Do you guys see it? And I know that. Peter doesn't want us to just exist physically and do stuff. Peter wants us to see that for our own ultimate personal good and for our peace and security before God, we need to purify our actions. Okay? Peter knows we'll die. You know that you'll die. Your physical body will definitely die. But when Peter talks about protecting your soul, he talks about your soul as the very thing that is purified by the acceptance of God's word when you believe, that is placed under God's protecting care and is destined for eternal salvation. That's why we need to check this war inside of us. And that is why we need to guard our hearts and we need to guard our souls because that will live forever. And the way that we don't guard our hearts and that we don't guard our souls is if we continuously choose for comfort, self-protection, and self-gratification. That's the battle that you and I are in daily. Let me say it in vernac. Man, this will be lacquer for me now. So I'm going to do it. That is what happens when you give in to your natural impulses. And Peter knows that the resolution of this individual conflict is the key to the resolution of the social conflict between Christians and their enemies, their naysayers, or their detractors. And what is that resolution? That resolution is our conduct. Okay? So Peter knows there's something going on inside of you. It's a massive battle. Peter knows that there's social conflict with people who don't believe. The answer to both of these, he says, is in your conduct. Remember, I already said that our identity becomes clear in our actions. So our inward reality should get outward expression. I've used this metaphor before. I'm going to use it again. The old chair metaphor, always a lacquer one to use. I believe that this chair can take my weight. I believe that it's a good chair. I believe that it's comfortable. Okay, just imagine that it's comfortable. I know that they aren't really comfortable. And I believe that I could sit there for a lengthy period of time. Inward reality. What do I need to do? Take a seat. Like sit on it. I could chat to you all day about my inward belief in this chair. If I really believe it, what's going to happen is I'm going to take action and I am going to actually sit on it. Because now my inward reality is the same as my outward action. Do you guys see it? Okay, so let's talk about our conduct. First point was who are we? And you've seen we have four amazing titles given to us. Where are we? We are in a battle, fam. And we are in between realities. Let's land here with the third one. How should we conduct ourselves? Now, I've just said that the resolution of this inward battle or in, uh, individual conflict is the same as the resolution for the social conflict between Christians and non-believers, and that is what we do. So the conflict in society is not won by aggressive behavior. It's won by good conduct or good works. Okay? And Peter will describe these good works later in his letter. It is yet to be defined. Peter's vision is that the exemplary behavior of Christians will change the minds of their accusers and in effect will overcome evil with good. Do you guys see it? So that means as Christians that we should know non-believers, 
We should even know them as friends. We should listen to non-believers. We should learn with non-believers. We should exist where non-believers exist while radically living different lives from them as we display the good news of Jesus through our action. Peter has already mentioned in his epistle day-to-day -day conduct. That's in chapter 1, 15 and 17. And he said in this day-to-day -day conduct, conduct, that is where we ought to practice holiness. That is where we ought to practice reverence towards God. But the emphasis that Peter places here now is on conduct, check, that can be seen and appreciated as good. Even by fellow citizens who are not believers in Christ. Do you guys get that? I mean, it's not about taking your kids to school and cooking food and taking out the trash bin. It's about doing actual things that people can go, that's good, and that's good, and that's good. That's what Peter is focusing on at the moment. Now, you might think Peter is being a little extra here, so let me call Jesus to the stage. Matthew 5, verse 16. In the same way, this is Jesus speaking, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. There's nothing prideful about doing good work, fam. We ought to do good work. And we ought to do it in such a way that the world can actually see it. Now there's an interesting word here. Look at the word observe in verse 12. They will observe. This is a Greek verb used in the New Testament only here and in chapter 3 in Peter. No one else ever uses this word in the New Testament. Now, it's interesting. This word means, it's an act, of, uh, uh, sorry, an act of observing that leads to a change of mind, that leads to a change in outlook. It's like having one's eyes opened to something not seen before. Can you guys imagine if we do good works and non-believers look at us and go, Whoa! I have never seen that. What you're showing me now, and what you're telling me now, it's changing my mind. And it's changing my outlook. That's what Peter says. And Peter says, if we conduct ourselves honorably, that is what will happen. Let's land here. I want to give us some time for self-evaluation. Let's do it. We're here anyway, and we're almost done, and I know that it's hot, but give me some good, ener give me some good energy here. Let's focus. Trace your daily steps. Just go through your day, your own imaginary journey, from waking up to doing your daily commute, to engaging with colleagues, to engaging with people in the marketplace, to engaging with your own family and kids, to engaging with your church family. All the way back from your commute, engaging with people around you, people in your community, people at your third place, which is where you train or action or do sports or whatever. How do you roll? Is it possible for people to see that you are a Christian? I just want to leave that question with you. And that means, brothers and sisters, the way we drive on the N1. That means the way we park at school. Everything. Can people see that you are a Christian? Then I want to ask you two more questions. If you think about this imaginary journey of your day, where is the potential for actual good works? Where can you do something that people will actually see it. And where people will actually know that is good stuff. Because there are potential. There is potential. I promise you. Just think. Let the Spirit illuminate that in your head. And then I want to ask you one last question and we'll be done. Where is there space for repentance and change? Because if we are convicted that our actions and attitudes are not Christ-like, repentance, turning, and change, being transformed, is what's ahead next for us. How do you roll daily? 
Where is their potential for actual good works? And where is their space for repentance and change? I just want to make some closing remarks. Fam, if we follow these waypoints, who are we, where are we, and how should we conduct ourselves? We will live radically different lives among non-believers, among the Gentiles, to use this translation, among those who are not God's people. Can I remind you, look at verse 10. You were not a people of God, but now you are. That's your reality. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are God's people, chosen for His possession to do in this world what He would want us to do. If we want to live these kind of lives, we have to be fluent in the gospel. May I remind you that we have grace for this. That Jesus gives us everything we need to live in this way. May I remind you that the struggle is real. And the struggle is ours. But the struggle is not for our sake. The struggle is for God's sake. The struggle is for His kingdom's sake. The struggle is for the gospel's sake. The struggle is so that this world could be set right and made right one person at a time. That's something that I'll struggle for. And that's something that we should struggle for. Our struggle is for the one that's called Waymaker. Father God, we believe what we just sung. And therefore, we want to pray that you would make a way for us to represent you in our actions and attitudes in a Christ-like way. We pray that you would be a miracle worker in our lives, Father God, that there would be turnaround and repentance and growth if we strayed from the past. Work a miracle in our lives so that we can find our way back again to you. We believe that you are a promise keeper. We believe that we are destined for eternal life with you. And we believe that we have been given this task in this world, in this in-between, in these tensions, to glorify you, Lord Jesus, and to see your kingdom come in our lives. May we remember that, and may we hold to your promises as we live in obedience to you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that in this week that we would not be pharisaical, that we would not think of ourselves um, um, more highly than we should, but also that we wouldn't do the Christian life out of obligation or guilt, but that we would be freed by the good news we heard today. You were the one who, give it, who, have given us, who has given us this new identity. You are the one who does this new thing inside of us. May we respond by grace and live accordingly. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your name would be glorified in our actions this week. Amen. Amen.